Welcome to this webinar, How Do We Decarbonise Our Existing Stock? I am Thomas Lane, the Technical Editor of Building Magazine. As we work towards the UK's 2050 net zero target, a key priority will be reducing emissions in Britain's 30 million existing buildings. Approximately 30% of the UK's carbon emissions come from buildings, with 79% of this generated by heating. So decarbonising this is central to meeting our targets. This will mean upgrading the thermal performance of many of these buildings and replacing oil and gas fired heating systems with electrical alternatives, such as heat pumps, with the idea that these will be supplied by carbon free electricity. To discuss how we can meet this monumental challenge, I am joined by three speakers. So um, first of all, we've got Nick Huston, who is a future energy business manager at Bacon UK. Simon Nicholas, who is a managing director of Europe for structural engineer at Robert Bird Group. And Matthew Thorpe, who is a managing partner of accountant Haynes Watts. So the procedure today will be each of our three speakers will present for about eight to ten minutes each and then we will take questions from you the audience so you can submit your questions at any time online either now or during the presentations or obviously after the presentations as well and whatever time we've got left we will dedicate to answer your questions so anyway so now without any further ado i'm going to hand over to our first speaker who is Nick Huston from Dakin. So thank you very much, Nick. Thank you. Yes, so thanks very much and welcome everybody. Um, good morning. Yeah, I'm just going to do a very brief sort of 10 minute presentation on um, how to decarbonize these existing stock, but mainly, mainly focus on um, solutions for heating. Um, so just a little bit about me, um, as sort of Thomas has said, I'm a future energy business manager for Dick and my background is very much in the sort of public sector work for local authorities and housing associations uh, and also for a national fuel poverty charity. So my general role involves just offering support, help, advice, um, working with key partners, um, working through government strategy and funding opportunities because it's quite an exciting um, sector at the moment. Now, uh, as I'm sure many of you will be aware, obviously the UK has got a commitment to net zero by 2050. It's, it's in the press and the public domain more than it's ever been before. Um, I think when it comes to um, carbon emissions, the UK has done a pretty good job up to now, but there's obviously still a, a long way to go. Uh, and when it comes to heating, uh, that's sort of the biggest, biggest challenge really. And that's because 80% of homes are still heated by gas. So that's, that's a fairly significant challenge. Um, there's lots and lots of new government policy around decarbonisation, electrification of heat, what's future home standards, and I've got a whole separate presentation on, on government policy. But yeah, we're certainly going in the right direction from a policy point of view, uh, and there's also lots and lots of funding opportunities as well, which I'll probably talk about briefly in a bit. Um, as far as Dakin's concerned, we've got our own energy for change campaign, so we're very much not just a manufacturer these days, we're, we're certainly a key driver and a key partner. Um, Last sort of October, well, that's just over 12 months ago now, you, you probably remember Boris Johnson talking about his seven point plan. Uh, and a key part of that for us was the plan to create 50,000 green jobs uh, and to install 600,000 heat pumps every year by 2028. Um, those sort of 12, 13 months ago when he said that, it felt a little bit as if it was a sort of finger in the air kind of figure, uh, a little bit ambitious. But certainly we've had lots of conversations with BASE uh, over the last 12 months and it's you know, it's a very realistic target now. Um, we've seen the breakdown, so yeah, everything is pretty much heat pumps um, at the moment. And I don't know if you saw the, the recent heat and building strategy, but um, I did a quick search and heat pumps are mentioned 350 times in it. So you can see how much government are focusing on heat pumps at the moment. Uh, this is just a, a graphic to show the scale of the heat pump growth in the UK market at the moment. Um, this is put together by the Committee on Climate Change. So back in 2019, um, the, the number of heat pumps that were installed, not just taking all manufacturers across the UK, was just under 23,000. Uh, in 2020, um, that did grow to about 35,000. That projection was right. Uh, and this year, projected to be about 70,000. I don't think we're that far off that, to be honest, but you can see really from next year and the year after, it's, it's pretty uh, significant growth. 
um, to get to the 600,000 by 2028 and well over a million by 2030. So to get there, there's obviously lots of challenges from the government's perspective. There's there's lots of new policy strategy, funding, huge amounts of funding. There's also lots of new market mechanisms, new regulations, new legislation. But literally everything is gearing up to slowing down the installation of gas boilers uh, and moving on to the pumps. Uh, in terms of that growth, where the sort of where the, the the sort of stock has broken down, as you can imagine, the two biggest areas are new builds. Um, when we've got a figure of 2025 where gas boilers uh, are probably not going to be able to be installed for any new building, but retrofit is the, the biggest area at the moment, and that's because we've got these 80% pumps still on, on gas boilers. But yeah, we've got a lot of funding support at the moment to uh, help that retrofit out of the market. Um, and just in terms of carbon savings, um, all the sort of government funding and policy and measures out there. Um, so there's a long list of measures that could be installed. It isn't just about heat pumps, it's about insulation and backup and wood layers. Um, but in terms of the sort of bang for your buck, if you like, the, the maximum impact uh, heat pumps is, is right at the very top there. And these are figures from the Energy Saving Trust, um, so we do place a fair bit of value on them. Um, not to say that all the, all the other measures don't have a value too, because they do, and they often work much better in conjunction, so that you wouldn't necessarily put a heat pump into a property that's really poorly insulated. So you would certainly look to do both. But yeah, in terms of impact, um, heat pump goes a long way to really reduce some carbon emissions. Uh, and the, the same with um, energy saving and costs as well. So running costs, so again, heat pumps can save up to sort of five, six hundred pounds a year, depending on what sort of heating system's coming out. Um, so again, all the other measures have got loads and loads of value, but yeah, heat pumps are uh, certainly very impactful when it comes to reducing fuel bills as well. Yeah, I'm not going to cover all these, and I mean, this presentation is going to go on to uh, be available on demand after the, after the session. Uh, and I'll be happy to talk to anybody about all these different funding pots, but this is this is just a, a snapshot to show um, the different funds that's available. And these, these are all available in the sort of hundreds of millions. So uh, we've had the Local Authority Delivery Scheme this year, which has been 500 million. The HUG scheme itself is, is part of a wider £2.5 billion pound home upgrade grant scheme. Uh, and just this week, we've seen the relaunch of the Warm Homes Fund as well. So there's, there's lots and lots of funding. Um, and part of my work is just to support organisations, help, help sort of work through all this, work out what funds are best, uh, what the criteria is, and, and almost where to start when looking at the housing stock. So, yeah, I'm certainly available to go through that in a lot more detail than I've just done, just done there. Um, and so I suppose why install heat pumps is a question I get asked a lot. And obviously, it is a, a key part of government policy at the moment. Um, We've heavily mentioned in the in the new heating building strategy, but they are a very good solution for funded projects. Um, and I suppose that what the little challenge has been with all these funded schemes is that they have been very tight time scales, um, and to put bids together fairly quickly, develop proposals, go down procurement routes, and, and deliver schemes within a very tight time scale. Um, but heat pumps are fine with that; they, they, they can be installed quickly. There's a growing installer network. Um, and as I mentioned, there's lots of funding support as well. So just to cover the key benefits, obviously it does reduce carbon emissions, as I've just sort of shown on that on that graph. Uh, actually, it does lower fuel bills, particularly on off-gas homes. There's a, a bit of a more of a challenge on um, gas homes due to the current gas and electricity tariffs. Uh, you can certainly reduce fuel poverty levels, again, mainly on off-gas homes at the moment. Um, very easy and quick to install. We have been a, a rapidly growing installer network. We still need a lot more installers. There's still a big opportunity for small businesses out there to come into this sector. Um, but yeah, heat pumps are certainly more accessible than they've ever been before. Uh, one of the things we've done to make them more accessible, and this was set up um, with, and that's much with Bayes guidance, but Bayes have been very keen on this uh, concept because it does almost help improve access, remove barriers, and dispel myths. So the keywords that Bayes are very sort of familiar with and, and supportive of. We've got some growth sustainable home centres. So um, at the moment, or prior to this, we had about six vacant offices and training centres uh, in sort of industrial estates. Not particularly that accessible, um, not that sort of customer friendly. Um, so we've now set up these centres. About, there's about 25 of them now, but we're going to grow that to 30 to 40 over the next sort of, uh, 12 months. And they're essentially sort of part showroom, um, part training centre, and part like, trade counter. So we'll actually hold stock. And the idea is that every, every region will have a sustainable home centre. So uh, clients, public sector, local businesses can all come to these centres and just see what heat pumps look like, how they work, um, do local training, and obviously buy from them as well. So it's a, a really good concept that, that they have been very keen on a part of their deployment plan. So 
So again, we've got lots of these centres, we've got lots of events that we're setting up um, over the coming months. So if anybody wants to know more on these, we can um, and just to, again, a little bit of a hint of what else we're working on, because it isn't just about uh, selling e-pumps. Um, connectivity is a, a really big issue at the moment. Um, the energy market is changing fast. Um, we've got lots and lots of these kind of terms, which you might have heard about, like electrification of heat and decarbonisation. We've got new climate tariffs coming, whether it's time of use or heat pump tariffs. Demand side response, looking at exactly how that heat pump is used and managing the sort of peaks and troughs in demand. Uh, and PV optimization as well is, a, is another um, big issue that we'll be looking at least to find a link how he pumps to all those existing PV panels on the roof across the country, the sort of hundreds of thousands of, of panels, uh, and just trying to use those a little bit more efficiently. Um, so all that free electricity that's been generated is actually used to run the heat pump rather than just getting exported back to the grid. Uh, and as I said, heat pump tariffs are absolutely on the way. We're working with quite a few partners, so they're just, uh, just about to be launched. They're very, very close now. Um, just exciting. And if, yeah, how it can help. So yeah, we we do really understand government policy. We work very closely with with Bayes on it. Um, uh, part of my role is to get my head around all these different funding pots. So yeah, we do really do support local authorities and housing associations to develop proposals, work out which funding's best, help with trying to work out which properties are best as well, um, and how you sort of work out what properties need insulating first and which ones don't. Uh, we'll certainly assist with helping write funding bids um, and provide access to our solar network. So yeah, we're, we're really trying hard to keep work as local as possible. So uh, any kind that I want to work with that wants to keep work within that region, yeah, we can give them a list of local installers. Um, we've also got lots of really good delivery partners as well. So yeah, we've got lots of partners on the finance side or on the delivery management of project side. So yeah, there's, there's plenty of support about. So yeah, just. Sort of put a question there which I want to answer myself if you're considering heat pumps so you want to know more then just yeah please come and talk to us um we're always available so yeah thanks very much great um well th thanks very much indeed nick um for that presentation it's very interesting i've got one question for you Lee, which i was very interested that you mentioned these specialist heat pump tariffs can you tell us a bit more about that i mean are they a sort of a reduced electricity rate for someone using a heat pump is that how it would work yes exactly and they are, they are really exciting i mean one of the biggest challenges to um reaching 600,000 by is, is that gas market so people with a gas boiler now who are looking at heat pumps uh, and the, the biggest issue with that is the, the current price of gas and electricity which is about five times higher electricity is five times higher the light heat pumps are about three to four times more efficient there's still, there's still an issue that um, heat pumps might be a little bit more expensive to run than a, than a gas boiler based on those tariff levels, which is why these heat pump tariffs are so important. So yeah, how, how they work essentially is you'll have one tariff for all your electricity appliances in the home and you'll have a second tariff for your heat pump use. A little bit similar to what's happening out there for um, electric cars, so all these home electric car charging points tend to run off much, much cheaper tariffs. And heat pumps will be the same. And quite a few of the energy suppliers now are, are almost putting heat pumps in, a, in electric car chargers together. So you'll, you'll get a, a, a set rate, whether it's 15, 16 pence for your electric, and you might get 7, 8, 9 pence for your, your heat pump in your electric car. So it's really positive thinking, um, and it'll certainly help um, this issue of uh, trying to close this gap between gas and electric. That sounds really interesting. Is that a sort of electricity company initiative, or is this being driven by government subsidy? Well, to be honest, it's um, certainly bears are, are driving it really hard, but there's also lots of... Um, uh, research projects like Innovate UK are really backing this as well. Uh, but the energy suppliers themselves are, are very keen. Certainly, they they drive it themselves. Um, they recognise the opportunity in the in the sort of heat pump market, and yeah, they're getting ahead of the curve a little bit and getting heat pump towers ready. So we're probably talking about three or four different suppliers. They're all um, they're all developing it. Yeah, exciting times. Absolutely. Yeah, well, I imagine we may well come back to this in the general Q and A. But thanks very much indeed um, for your presentation. So we're now going to move on to our next speaker who is simon nicholas uh, managing director for um, robert bird group the, the european section so over to you simon thanks very much good morning um it's great to have the opportunity to speak today um i'm simon nicholas from robert bird group uh, structural and civil engineers uh, and so my takes um from the structural engineers perspective um about how do we get better use out of our existing building stock so what are emissions? Well, we generally group emissions into two categories. 
embodied being the emissions from the materials that physically make up the buildings and operational the emissions from the heating and cooling and the use of the buildings. So as a structural engineer, uh, I'm much more able to influence and um, uh, take advantage of embodied carbon. That's my area of responsibility um, and what I'm going to focus on today. Um, so there's many different uh, organisations and institutions currently seeing targets for carbon emission reductions. Uh, the World Green Building Council, uh, Business Ambition 1.5 and UK Green Building Council um, Roadmap Targeting Net Zero. Uh, Robert Berg Group have affiliated and signed up to each of these in different ways. Um, and as a designer, as a structural engineer, um, as I said, we're most interested in the embodied carbon and setting uh, some relatively aggressive um, carbon reduction targets of at least 40% reduction by 2030. And as an organization, we're actually looking to better that and, and target 50% reduction. Um, and then in terms of our own emissions, as an organization, we've committed to becoming a net zero organization and um, our scope one and two um, emissions relate largely to our offices and the energy performance of our offices. Um, so that's of interest to us. Um, but what do we do with the existing buildings? And, and that's what we're here to talk about today. We see existing buildings are, are an opportunity to reduce the embodied carbon or and carbon generally. Um, we, this is some photos of our current office um, in Southwark, London. Um, it's, a, um, off, it's a converted building from a previous warehouse building back from the 20s and 30s. Um, and we find it as a great place to work and to operate from. Uh, and it's got real character and it's got um, a long life ahead of it from a purely structural performance point of view. Uh, however, it doesn't perform very well in its operational carbon. Um, so we, what do we want to do with our existing buildings? The embodied carbon emissions of existing building stock is, stock is already spent. The impact of these emissions is already part of the cause of climate change. It's a sunk cost, um, but it can be viewed as an investment in our future if we maintain and reuse these buildings. And we shouldn't waste that carbon which has gone into those buildings. So we need to make the most of our existing buildings and body carbon to avoid incurring new carbon from em carbon emissions from the em demolition and rebuilding. Here's a photo of our building from the outside. Uh, and as you can see, it's got opening windows um, and uh, generally doesn't perform very well in its operations. So should we knock it down and rebuild it? Um, if we knocked it down and rebuilt it, we would be, yes, we would be generating an opportunity to reduce the operational emissions and resolve some of those, um, the, the, the challenges of existing building stock of not being good in the operational energy. But in knocking it down and rebuilding it, we would generate a lot of additional embodied carbon from that new building. As structural engineers, there's things we can do to reduce the amount of embodied carbon in new buildings. And we certainly are implementing those things on our new building projects. Um, but there's a real opportunity to reuse existing building stock, refurbish them and, and uh, make them fit for years to come. So I think there's real challenges and opportunities in this. So as, as buildings, uh, the, the building we're in, it used to be a warehouse building, it's now functioning very well as an office building. Um, and there's opportunities to enhance it as a, a, an office building for the future, or to look at changes to different uses. We see this increasingly across the industry at the moment, shopping centers and retail is changing dramatically. How do those assets get repurposed into different, different uses, et cetera. Um, and then there's different extents of repurposing or, or intervention. Uh, we might start off by simply keeping the existing building structure and enhancing the facade for the energy performance and, and upgrading and improving the MEC, MEP systems, therefore enhancing the operational energy performance of the existing building and maintaining the existing embodied carbon of the existing structure. Or in the middle, we might start to look at actually um, enhancing the building by adding additional floors. Um, many buildings, such as our current office building, have surplus capacity in them inherent and um, have the opportunity to add additional floors with very minimal intervention to the existing building. 
Or you might do something more dramatic where um, more intervention is needed, but you're still finding ways of maintaining the existing body carbon of the existing structure, uh, but growing the building and, and making the, the new building um, uh, to enhance the, the use of the site and grow the use of the site. And then there's different things we can do. We can grow up, we can grow down, we can grow out. Uh, it's important to think about these different options and how we can add value to a project um, and to a developer while seeking to reuse that embodied carbon of the existing structure to its optimal intent. To achieve this, it's important that we, as, uh, as engineers and as project teams, um, seek to really understand the existing structure and to try to justify the future. Um, too often, it's, it's, we've worked on projects in the past where people have not been interested in seeking to reuse. They just want a clean slate and to start again. But actually, with a little effort, you can generally turn up some pretty good um, documentation of, of many existing buildings um, through document searches and investigation. Uh, you can undertake intense, uh, intrusive surveys and material testing to understand the existing structure and, and what is there. And, and there's digital data capture, such as point cloud surveys, et cetera, which can pretty efficiently be turned into to models to be able to take forward um, design and optimization. It's also important to uh, consider the design methodology and the construction sequence. Uh, and this is about problem solving and about thinking through how uh, structure in one form can be convert and upgrade into a different form. The methodology for that and the construction sequence for that often can drive the design and determine whether a project is viable or not. And there's just a couple of examples. We also should be looking to take advantage of surplus capacity and trading off of loads. Often historic designs were designed for much higher loadings than would be needed for the new building uses. Um, and there's opportunity to take advantage of that through just comparison of what the building was originally designed for and what its uh, new loading regime might be. Um, and often this can end up uh, being able to justify the addition of additional floors uh, with minimal or negligible uh, strengthening or enhancement of the existing structure. We should also be looking at, um, for that enhancement, different lightweight and low carbon options. And what are the tipping points for when um, column or foundation uh, strengthening would be needed and, and optimizing the, the extent of the uh, additional structure to suit that. So to conclude, um, be innovative and creative. Look for opportunities and way of, ways of justifying reuse and don't default to demolition. Anyone can do new build. Thank you. Great. Well, um... Thanks very much, Simon, for your presentation. Um, that's really good. Um, I mean, it's, inter I mean, it's interesting when what you're, you're, you're saying about sort of obviously repurposing buildings. I mean, are you finding that clients are now beginning to consider refurbishment when before yes, they would have said, let's just demolish it and start again? Uh, I think increasingly so, yes. As um, many of our developer clients are signing up for a pretty um, ambitious carbon reduction targets for their portfolio and, and for their future, which is great to see. And there are real challenges in achieving that and um, having at least some of the portfolio of new projects being the reuse and enhancement of existing buildings um, can dramatically um, contribute to those reduction savings, carbon reduction savings of future developments. So yes, we're, we're very much seeing clients shifting their focus to um, how can we make best use of the carbon we already have embodied in the buildings we already have, rather than just pushing that aside and then having to justify um, a carbon outcome of a new development. And, and kind of how far are they prepared to go? I mean, you know, I mean, some buildings, I guess, if you've got lots of redundancy in the structure and you've got generous floor to ceiling heights and all that sort of thing, it's, you know, and you're filling up the footprint of the site. You can see it makes a lot of sense, but there's a lot of buildings where it's not quite so straightforward. I mean, are there are clients now making prepared to make bigger compromises when it comes to the less than ideal scenario? Um, I think all well, life is compromised, development is compromised. It's what are you going to compromise? Uh, and increasingly, the um, as the carbon um, 
carbon measure of projects is assessed by building purchases and, and tenants, uh, decision, the commerciality is shifting. And um, therefore being able to say to a, a prospective tenant or, or purchaser that this, the carbon credentials of this development uh, enhance because of this area, they'll get a, a higher purchase price or, or a, a, um, a better tenant in place. So the, the, I think the commerciality of it is shifting. Um, and so what, what is the compromise? Maybe there's not a compromise, but it's just different. Um, and I think we're seeing clients uh, taking more time and more energy to investigate and understand what is the opportunity to reuse rather than just assuming that it will be demolished and we'll start again. Um, and I don't think there should be any one size fit all. Each site is different. And what I would encourage is that um, people genuinely look at the existing building and see what opportunity there is to reuse some or all of it um, and use that as part of their decision-making process during the early stages of a, of a project conception. Great, well, thanks very much indeed, Sam. That's really interesting and very encouraging too. Um, so we're now going to move on to our last speaker, who is Matthew Thorpe, the managing partner from Accountant Means What. So it's over to you, Matthew. Thank you. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, yeah, so I'm Matthew Thorpe. I'm the managing partner of the Haynes Watts Essex office. Haynes Watts is a top 15 firm of accountants, tax and business advisors. We specialise in supporting owner managed businesses. Personally, construction and the built environment makes up more than 70% of my client portfolio. So my perspective on today's discussion is the financial impact that the changes needed will have on businesses and individuals. I think everyone agrees that the corporate world aligning with net zero ambitions is going to be a critical component of delivering the UK's emissions pledge. Uh, and with so many large corporations committing to ambitious programmes, including the likes of BlackRock, world's largest investor, coming out and saying that they will be taking an active stance against directors failing to focus on and deliver a green agenda, uh, I think it's safe to say that it's gathering momentum. However, for many small and medium businesses, I think there remains a sense of trepidation about how to approach the change, how to dovetail it with their commercial strategies and how it's going to impact them financially. Uh, I work with lots of home builders, property developers, main contractors and construction trades generally. And the overwhelming feeling that I have is that firms are really balanced on a knife edge at the moment. There are those that are committed to being at the forefront of change, innovating and growing rapidly as they take advantage of, uh, by and large, being smaller and more nimble than their multinational rivals. Uh, but equally, there are others who feel left behind, those that don't know where to start, don't know how to identify their present footprint and position, let alone how to implement the change required to keep them relevant and growing. Uh, I think they're concerned about the upfront cost of implementing green policies, where and how to fund it, uh, and how and when the return on investment is likely to come. I think one of the key issues, in my experience, is that the mindset of many business owners is around tangible return on investment from things that they can implement, monitor, and ultimately control. And I think in the minds of many, the move to net zero is currently driven mainly by the negative effects of doing nothing rather than the positive effects of making change. And that's not to say, you know, I think they, they recognise by and large that the long term cost of doing nothing could be high. I think there's likely to be future tax charges or penalties for failing to reduce emissions, likelihood of lost business to competitors that have been proactive. Uh, let alone obviously the, the environmental catastrophe looming. Uh, I think the difficulty is at this moment in time for a lot of businesses it feels really hard to quantify and that for most business owners tends to lead to delays in decision making and implementation. Uh, I really believe that what is needed to drive the major change that we need across the whole built environment sector at this moment in time is clarity and support in three key areas. I think for me, the first is we really need clear regulation, including the metrics that businesses of all sizes should be using to monitor their performance. 
for a small or medium business, this really can be a minefield. And when a business puts something in the too hard box, uh, quite often it stays there even after things progress and it might not be so hard anymore. Uh, you know, there's an estimated need to retrofit 19 million homes and countless more commercial and industrial units in our existing stock. Much of this work is going to be driven by small and medium businesses. And at this moment in time, many of those businesses don't know their own carbon footprint, they're unclear on how to calculate it, uh, and they've got no idea how to make meaningful improvements. As a good example, businesses who are out there operating inefficient vehicle fleets, working from poorly insulated premises with paper based systems and covering a broad geographical area as they make green installations in other people's homes and businesses is you know, clearly counterproductive. I think businesses of all sizes really need clear, appropriate targets and methods for monitoring their position. I think the second thing that we really need to, to get right is some suitable carrots for the industry. There are already, as many of you will be well aware, uh, a number of big advantages to being at the forefront of the net zero journey. You've got things like research and development tax credits, which can support fledgling businesses with innovative ideas by providing them with cash credits, allowing them to survive longer in their pre-revenue periods when they're finding new and more efficient solutions. They can support businesses to offer cutting edge solutions at a more competitive price point by providing them with a lower tax burden versus their traditional competitors. We've got things such as patent box relief, which is they're rewarding those that are seeking new solutions to problems by heavily reducing tax on the profits generated through use of patented products and processes. Uh, but I think it's safe to say that far more needs to be done to get the, the broad buy-in that's really needed from business. Uh, you know, grants to incentivise homeowners for change, I think need to be, uh, and clearly Nick touched on in his presentation that there is a wealth of funds out there at the moment, more funding than there has ever been. Uh, but I think the key for me is that in order to get the change moving forward, what really needs to happen is those grants need to be simple and easily accessible. I think often they can feel confusing to the end user. Uh, I think personally taxes on property will need to be aligned with the emissions targets. There will need to be the offer of incentives on rates and council tax for efficient buildings. Uh, and businesses delivering services to the nation's property stock need to be adequately rewarded for the investment that they're making in changing their operations to do that in a green way. And I think, as is always the case, you can't have one without the other. I think if we need suitable carrots for business to embrace this change, the other thing we are going to need is sufficient sticks for, for some of the, the stragglers, shall we say. Uh, as with all changes, some businesses will embrace them and be in the vanguard, but many more will simply wait, continue as usual and change when they're forced to do so. And I really believe that there is a balance to be struck that enforces positive change without heavily penalising businesses. Uh, I believe it needs to start with giving clear measurement methods, setting appropriate implementation targets for reduction, and then implementing those suitable taxations on businesses failing to take reasonable steps. Now, I realise it may sound odd for an accountant that represents small and medium businesses to advocate additional tax charges, uh, but the one thing that experience tells me is that a clear, fair system is where businesses thrive. They want certainty, they don't want lack of clarity, they don't want to have to second guess what changes are coming down the pipe, they want to know the environment they're operating in and be able to make sound decisions. So I think just my, my closing remark is my, my overwhelming belief at the moment is that more needs to be done by government to give clarity, adequate reward, suitable penalisation, and I believe that as an industry, the built environment needs to lead that conversation and drive the change harder and faster than is, than is currently happening, you know, notwithstanding the amount of fantastic work already being done. Great. Well, thanks very much indeed, Matthew, for your presentation. Um, so if I can invite um, our other speakers to 
turn on their cameras and microphones and we can sort of turn into some general questions now. So uh, message to our audience, if you've got a question you want to put to our expert panel, now is the time to do so. So we've got a question already actually, which I think is probably pretty relevant to you, Matthew, um, that came in during the presentation, which is the question of BAT. So, um, so new build has got a 0% rate, um, whereas, as we know, refurbishment um, has um, is charged out at um, 20%, which is quite a big sort of financial hit. Um, and with this 5% rate, there isn't very really much, maybe much available. So, um, I guess, Matthew, from your point of view, if the BAT rates are equalised in favour of um, you know, the 0% rate was the default option for refurbishment. How much difference do you think that would make? Vast, actually, I think it would make a, a huge difference. I think the reality is that on most new build projects, uh, you know, firstly, as you say, they, they're carrying a zero rate. Where there is VAT within the delivery chain, most large corporations will be able to engineer the VAT away from them and out of that chain anyway. They will have quality tax advisors and complex enough structures to do that. So I think the, the fundamental point tends to be those smaller and mid-sized developers. And I think you, you're absolutely right. I think it is a huge determinant to convert rather than demolish and build new that you've got the VAT in the chain that isn't going to be recovered, I think it, it really puts people off. And I think, to my mind, it feels very, very out of line with the government's targets on emissions to not have already addressed that. And I think, you know, when we talk about retrofit, there are things that have been done, the reduced rate on installation of air source heat pumps. But even then, I think the, the disparity in treatment, there is something that Something that I hear a lot is, I think, the lack of clarity in how those rules are to be applied often causes real confusion for small businesses. And I will often have business owners say, look, at the moment, we are really struggling, that legislation particularly, which I'm sure, Nick, you'll know far more than me about. The 5% the on air source heat pumps, the legislation initially very specifically excluded installation of air conditioning units. Now that has been changed and removed, but what that really did was drive disparity. You had bigger organisations who wanted to comply with the rules, going out and pricing work correctly, pricing air conditioning installations as air conditioning installations, and coming and saying to us, look, we're losing a raft of work because at the moment there are, and not wishing to generalise, but smaller sole trade, man and a van type firms, who are going out and pricing that work at 5%, knowing that it's not really, but arguing that it's it's got an air source heat pump element. So I think the, the practicalities are, you just need clarity in the system and for it to be fair. And I think equalising the rates for new build and refurbishment would go a long way to doing that. Okay, well, brilliant. Thank you, Matthew, for that. And I guess, Nick, um, I mean, what's, you know, in light of what Matthew's saying about sort of air conditioning versus heat pumps, What's your take on the question? Yeah, I, yeah, I, mean, I completely agree. It's just, um, it, it just want that clarity. I mean, um, yeah, I've looked into the sort of VAT and it, it does change a lot on some of its 20%, some of its 5%. It just depends on whether it's a grant funded scheme, some isn't, retrofit new bills different. And we get asked the question an awful lot as well. And certainly when it comes to the government funded schemes as well, they don't often um, allow that inclusion of that as well. So that the client is requ required to pay for it. So yeah, it's a big it's a big question. Um yeah, and I don't always have the answer. I'm struggling around myself to try and get that clarity. So yeah, like Matthew said, we, we do need that uh clarity to come through pretty quickly. Okay. And, and finally, I mean Simon, you probably got to take on this as well, because obviously it's affecting um, you know, you've been talking about repurposing rather than new build. Um it must have an impact on your clients. Uh maybe, but I'm not actually um I don't think that's something I've got a view on particularly. I'll, I'll stick with the design. Okay, thank you. Fine. Okay. Um, right, so sort of moving on now, um, this may be one actually for you, um, Simon. It's a question that came up during your, your presentation. Um, 
which is really, I mean, it's very quite a topical one, this actually. I mean, the, the, the question there is referring to the, the tulip, um, which, if you all know, was rejected by Michael Gove earlier this week, um, and one of the reasons cited being it was an awful lot of embodied carbon in the concrete um, of the structure. So, um, I mean, I, I, are people finding that, in the light of this, that planning departments are actually you know, considering the embodied carbon um, impacts of projects um, when they're making decisions over um, over new projects or refurbishment projects or whatever it may be. What's the experience of our panel on that? Um, yeah, I think increasingly so. Um, the London plan is setting out um, um, a path to really take that as a key part of um, the, the circular economy design principles. And I think increasingly there's this talk of uh, Part Z being introduced to the building regs we have to report on on carbon and i think that is the an important step for the building industry to go in to be at least forced to report where your carbon statistics are and logically to start to have to uh, ratchet down um, the carbon emissions like we've done with par l over the last decade um, to start actually doing something similar with embodied carbon and, and that'll help developers, help engineers, help projects make decisions where they see the value in keeping existing structures and augmenting and reusing them, not just taking the, the default of, um, of tear it down and start again. So I, I do see that as something which is going to become an increasingly important part of the decision-making process and therefore part of the planning process. Um, yeah, I think regulation is important. But we, regulation in my mind is about making sure the minimum standards are always ratcheting up and getting better. And, um, and the first movers and the, um, and the progressive developers and the progressive architects and engineers are the ones who will actually lead the way. Yeah, it's, it's complicated. I mean, um, I don't know, would, would anyone else like to come in on this, on this topic of embodied carbon? I mean, Matthew, you mentioned the challenges proposed to, you know, some of the, your, your um, clients. I mean, whole, whole life carbon, embodied carbon calculations are quite complicated, aren't they? Uh, yes, I think my, my only contribution on that would be, it's not something I know a huge amount about, but certainly any construction clients that I am speaking to, any developers that I'm speaking to, at this moment, by and large, consider it uh, a pain point rather than an opportunity. I think they find it very complicated to, to work out. I think as Simon rightly says, there will be very, very good forward thinking developers who will lead the charge. Uh, but I do think at the moment we're in that position where the lion's share find it a pain rather than an opportunity. Yeah, I would just add that it's not, I don't think it is actually hard to calculate, but there's a learning and um, an awareness piece the whole industry needs to go through. And um, once you actually click into a few things and you recognise how simple it, simple it is once you know a few key things, you know the amount of material of a given type, you then need just to understand where does that material come from. And, and increasingly there's libraries and lookup tables by, by institutions which help provide that as a standardized thing for different concrete specs, et cetera. Mm. And then you can apply that very quickly actually to um, information which comes naturally out of a design process. So there's a real learning which the industry needs to go through. But once you've learned it, it's not hard. Right, I think that probably answers one of our questions which came through there, which is how you measure embodied carbon. Uh, yeah, we, we've developed um, tools which augment our BIM environment. We take our BIM information, predominantly Revit information, uh, extracting from that to the quantities, and then we're inputting additional information into our models, which says the concrete spec is this, we're looking at cement replacements, um, it's got the steel coming from this type of steel mill, so therefore it's a whichever um, embodied carbon of that. And then we can just press a button and it, it spits out um, what is the, the in carbon of our design structure uh, by different elements, by different things. And then as engineers, we can then start to target savings by refining those specifications, looking at alternatives uh, and driving down the overall carbon. Okay, um, thank you. So, um... So moving on to some earlier questions we had, actually, which is probably for you, Nick. We had we had several questions on this actually, which was um, 
heat pumps are great, but actually you've got to get the heat into the building. So I think some people are asking me about how you do that. Do you need bigger radiators? Um, you know, what was your answer be to, to, to that aspect of um, going down the heat pump route? Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's a good, good question, really. I mean, it's, it's essentially, I mean, the, the whole heap of market's moved on a lot. It has developed in the past sort of five years. And um, prior to that, I was very much trying to make a heat pump fit a certain property type, and it didn't always exactly fit. A little bit about square pegs and round holes. But nowadays, there's there's literally a heat pump to suit every kind of property scenario. So the start of very sort of small four kilowatt ones going up to sort of, um, you know, mega kilowatts, if, if need be, on the commercial side. Uh, the question of radiators is asked a lot, um, and it's it's almost finding that sweet spot. So I've got lots of low temperature heat pumps that run around sort of 50, 55 degrees, which means the radiators are sort of warm to touch rather than hot. Um, and depending on the sort of size of the existing radiators, that they, they may need to be changed and upgraded slightly, uh, or the pipe work might need to be upgraded. But we do have higher temperature heat pumps that will happily run at 65 plus up to 80 degrees in some cases, where radiators don't need to be changed. Um, it's one of the things that bears are looking quite closely at when they're thinking about deployment because we get to 600,000 by 28 and a million by 2030. They want to see the cost of full uh, supply and install come down. And one of those areas to do that is to, to not change radiators in every single uh, retrofit job. But yeah, I think we'll see more and more of these higher temperature heat pumps um, being installed. But ultimately, it's a, it's a sweet spot between, I mean, generally, the, high, the higher. Higher flow rates, higher temperatures, slightly lower efficiencies. Um, so it's finding that sort of sweet spot when you're designing a, a heat pump at certain properties. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to ask you, I mean, maybe again, Nick, one for you. You probably won't like this one, but what what, what do you think about the um, role of hydrogen? I mean, the government have always since said that hydrogen was. Uh, going to be, you know, something that's going to be quite an important part of their strategy, and they're going to make a decision by 2026. Um, I mean, some homes are going to be very difficult to retrofit, are going to be very inefficient, and maybe maybe a heat pump isn't the best solution. Do you think hydrogen is one answer for those hard to treat homes? Uh, definitely, yeah. I mean, we have we sort of talk to base on a on a daily basis about this, and um, also with some of our partners like the gas network operators. And yeah, hydrogen is absolutely going to have a place at at some point in the future. A little bit like we've got sort of a mix of heating types now with electric oil and coal and um, and gas. I think we'll have hydrogen and heat pumps at some point in the future. Um, at the moment, it's it still feels a little bit way off. Um, hydrogen. We've been talking about, we've got a hydro heat pump, for example, which uses um, sort of part heat pump, part gas boiler. And that gas boiler can already take a sort of a 20% hydrogen mix. So, yeah, we're, we're part of the sort of movement ourselves. Um, but yeah, we're, we're not sort of saying heat pumps are going to be in every single home. It's going to be hydrogen and impossible with it. So, yeah, we've got a, a lot to improve, but we're talking very closely with a, a huge range of partners on that as well. So, yeah, we're, we're very much in the mix of it all. Thank you. Would anyone else like to comment on the sort of, you know, hydrogen as one possible answer to decarbonisation? Definitely outside my my sphere of knowledge, I'm afraid, Thomas. Okay. Fine. Thank you. Um, right. Um, some more questions. Uh, this might, might be one for you, Matthew. Um, quite specific, actually. But um, let's find the question is. What would your best advice be on the B18 finances for schools who are doing their best to reduce carbon emissions? That's quite general. Uh, I, know, but... <laughs> I think it, it's probably too case specific to, to answer generally. I think the, the answer is take proactive advice. I think the, the biggest case of VAT leakage in any project is a client going to the advisor having made the decisions implemented the design uh, and then seeking solutions rather than engaging suitable professional advice at the initial stage of planning a project so i think taking suitable early advice is how i would address it i think to give uh, more specific advice would probably be misleading people on something that is always very case specific Sure, yeah, absolutely, completely understood. Um, what about, um, 
I mean, is there any role? Because there's another question coming in about battery storage and solar panels. Um, are these an important tool when it comes to decarbonising um, our buildings? You know, more solar panels on buildings and battery storage as well, maybe taking advantage of off peak electricity. Yeah, I can probably answer that first. I mean, the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, what, what we're seeing now is a, is a movement towards things like demand side response and time of use, how sort of energy is being used, how it's being generated, how it's being stored, and just making sure that it's what is used is used efficiently as well. So trying to draw down cheap electricity uh, from off peak nighttime terrace, for example, or generating, making the most of any sort of PV systems that are generated. But having all those technologies linked as well. So I think I briefly mentioned having sort of PV panels on the roof and being able to optimize that that PV generation. So if the resident isn't at home and there's no appliances on timers, then rather than that, that sort of PV generation just getting exported, it's used to pre the cylinder or it could be used to sort of heat the heat pump um, at certain times of the day. So it's it's about being a little bit smarter about all the sort of technologies together. But yeah, we've got quite a few projects where we've got PV battery and heat pumps uh, and smart controls and some smart tariffs. So yeah, it's definitely um, definitely the future. Okay, would anyone else like to comment on the role of battery storage and PV? I'll take that as a no. Um, Nick, I've got a question. I mean, is, is, much has been made about the £5,000 grants um, that were announced for the heat and building um, strategy that anyone who um, wants to install a heat pump will be financially more attractive, but with this grant. Do you know what are there any kind of conditions lurking um, in, in somewhere in these grants that are going to, I don't know, insist on more insulation first or anything like that? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. I mean, we do still need to see the um, the full guidance, but I mean, there will be conditions because it's essentially a replacement for the RHI, the Renewable Heat Incentive, and there was lots of conditions there about um, to make sure the property was well insulated, and, and rightly so. So I think we'll expect to see certain levels of, of insulation required. Generally, like lofts and cavities um, is a sort of the priority really. In the past, have been a little bit more vague about uh, solid wall properties because they haven't said in the past that you had to fit external wall insulation before you fit a heat pump and um, sort, of, sort of stop short of that. So we need to see what that looks like because um, as far as like our, our sort of design service and MCS, you, you wouldn't necessarily fit a heat pump even if you could get the grant um, if the heat loss is just too great. So insulation is going to need to find out. Um, I don't think social housing providers are included in the new boiler upgrade scheme as well, which is a bit of a miss for me because they were included in the RHI. So we need to see how that sector is going to be affected. But um, yeah, I mean, I think when you look at the growth figures as well, it's it's a fairly small fund. It's sort of 450 million, but that that'll go quickly um, if this sort of growth figures pick up as fast as they've been projected. So yeah, it's it's a good fund. Um, there's lots of other funds as well, but um, yeah, I think we need to see a lot more detail in the guidance. And uh, sorry, I can keep asking other questions, but there's another question for you. So again, in the heat building strategy, the government said that by 2030, a heat pump will come down to the same price as a gas boiler now. I suppose, I suppose it's about two or three thousand pounds. Is that realistic? Are we going to get really cheap heat pumps? Well, I mean, the will come down is, I mean, I've, I've, this is part of sort of my role in talking to lots of different partners. And um, uh, for example, one of the areas where Bays are certainly looking at saving is is the sort of cost to to do like surveys and uh, all the sort of prep work before an actual heat pump install takes place. So if you've got a typical heat pump install of sort of 10, 10 or twelve thousand pound, the heat pump cost of it is actually quite a small part of that. Um, but there's lots of costs wrapped up in doing surveys and keeping MCS uh, requirements right and and past ten thirty five, which is part of a lot of the funding. So there's lots of costs associated with. With surveys, um, and I think that's one of the areas we'll see um, some reduction in if we can maybe do a single survey, for example, or even a, a remote survey. But the thing, the one um, very large organisation yesterday with a new heat pump um, innovation fund, a bids have released, uh, and they're looking to put together a bid around the whole aspect of surveys and trying to. Uh, to improve that customer journey, so we're not doing lots of like dead surveys where it doesn't need to any work. Um, it's all much more streamlined. So I think we'll 
whether it will come down to three thousand pounds or four thousand pounds is a big question, but I think the cost will naturally come down. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I was going to ask each of you actually, because we're near nearing the end of the session, um, for your sort of one. We are. This is a huge challenge. There's so, so many moving parts to sort of decarbonising our existing buildings. What, you know, if there's one thing that would make a big difference. What would that be? It's a question to each of you to sort of outline what you think that would be and why. Matthew, do you want to go first? Yeah, I think for me, it's the thing that would really make a big difference is, oh, it's probably too big of an overarching point, but cohesiveness. It's people working together. It is people, you know, Simon talking there about how easy it is to calculate emissions, embodied carbon, Nick talking about the various solutions, grants, approaches, getting that information sharing so that actually everybody in the sector knows, knows what sensible approaches are, knows what hasn't worked for people. And the difficulty as always is overcoming people's desire to protect their commercial advantage and therefore not want to share with competitors, I think it's getting the balance right between driving the whole sector forward and being able to protect the, the personal interests of each entity, for me. So I think it's that sharing element. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point, actually. Thank you for that. Um, Simon? Um, for me, I think it's about seeing this as an opportunity and people in um, developers and architects and engineers looking for that opportunity, looking for ways to avoid the waste of knocking buildings down in order to regenerate. Um, that, that is just so wasteful. And, um, and seeing it as an opportunity, how can we make best use of what we've already spent? Um, and um, finding ways of uh, making fit for current and future use, um, making it um, savings and how buildings can be operationally energy efficient um, and what is the right compromise in that maybe you're doing something which is an upgrade which you knowingly are only getting you for the next 10 or 20 years knowing in 10 or 20 years our industry will have decarbonized further so therefore the knockdown and rebuild in 20 years time will have a much lower body carbon um, of the new build because we will decarbonize the cement and the steel industry etc in 20 years time so, so maybe just adding 20 years to a building's life is good enough but we should have that discussion um, and we should aim to find those opportunities great well, thanks for that point okay and finally nick yeah i think in certainly in the retrofit world um i think there's it, it just a little bit more sort of guidance from from government in terms of these funding policies and huge funding process out there because it, it, it does feel a little bit stop and start and there's a lot of overlap with them with very tight time scales and I think we need to be in a position where the client base is starting to build a little bit capacity and capability um because there's still lots of sort of challenges out there with with lack of resources and, and structures and time um you yeah, know local authorities haven't got a lot of time and do all these things so just I think bears just need to come out and try and clear it all up a little bit have longer term funding programs uh, wider funding windows um, and then alongside that, like Matthew said, just there's a lot of support out there and there's some really good partners. So yeah, they don't have to do it by themselves. They just need to, to come together and share all this good practice and lessons learned. Yeah, yeah we can get there eventually. Brilliant. Well, thanks very much. Well, that brings our session to a close. So I'd just like to thank all of our speakers very much for your time. It's been a really interesting discussion. It's going to be one that will run and run and run, I think, for a long time yet. And um, to thank our audience for listening. And if anyone wants to hear the webinar again or pick up on anything in it, it will be available to download. So thank you very much indeed. And good afternoon. Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks, guys.